Let me brave my son, I'll be home soon The boy held on to hope Till he got that awful news And as they folded up the stars and stripes Twenty-one guns pointed towards the sky As the shots rang out, he flinched a little each time Then a soldier in his best dress walked up to him and you know the rest This show is brought to you by Operation Encore. Operation Encore is a 501c nonprofit that is helping change the lives of our veteran community. Let me tell you a little bit about what they do. They are helping veterans get into the music industry. They're helping them learn the business, get songs recorded, and not only that, making dreams happen. You know, most of these veterans have got the idea of becoming a, a musician way before they went into the military. And Operation Encore is filling that gap from while they served in the military and helping them change their lives and live out those dreams. Operation Encore is a nonprofit. You can go to this link right there and click on it. Give them a little help. Hit that donate button. Follow them. Learn about all the great things that Operation Encore does for our veterans. Hey, welcome everybody to to, to uh, Spirits and Stories, man. I'm still stuck on the old name, man. Y'all, y'all gonna have to start sending me some more hate mail. But uh, welcome to Spirits and Stories with Don Dunn. I'm your host. We have got a uh, great show today. Um, it is something a little bit different. It, we have had uh, something similar um, in season one, and I'm looking forward to to this one. So let me introduce. I'm going to butcher her name again. I just got to thinking Ar- Artemisia Divine. She's she's just going to have to send the uh, the jury after me and hang me. She is a sexual fantasy expert who teaches the world's leading sex experts the meaning of our sexual fantasies and how to bring them out of our heads and into our beds. Author of upcoming book, The Spirituality of Smut. I love it. The Surprising Wisdom of Sexual Fantasies. Certified somatic sexologist, BA in anthropology, that is awesome, and former sex worker and professional dominatrix. Let's bring on Artemisia. Thanks How's so it much going? for having me. Thank you. I'm really, really excited to be here. I actually listened to two episodes of your show and had such a, it was such an interesting thing because, um, I got to be in the intimate company of people I normally wouldn't encounter and hear what they would say, which was, um, yeah, that's actually what I liked about sex work too, is I'd end up in the company of people I normally wouldn't encounter (laughs) (laughs) and find out about them as well in quite interesting ways. But I really like that. There's something quite special and and, um, humanising about uh, having conversations with those people who come from different walks of life than us, isn't there? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And and I know, you know, where I'm at, our laws and your guys' laws are a little bit different. But but to kind of give you a little bit of back history, um, mm-hmm. my father and my mother were both in the sex working industry on the mm-hmm. legal side of America. But they were. Um, so as I grew up, I didn't live with them. I was adopted, but I did see my dad quite a bit. And as I grew up being young, I was extremely curious because I didn't understand really what was going on. And I would ask the girls questions. And and as I grew up, the stories got a little bit weirder and weirder. And I got to learn that there's there's a whole nother side of, of this industry that, that people don't think about. And uh at least I know in, in where I'm at, you know, some of these girls, some of the stories that they talked about, it just involved talking and, and people that were just lonely. It wasn't always the the dirty image that, that people had. It did have that, but that wasn't the only thing. Is that kind of the, the same in, in the industry where you're at? Or I know with it being legal, it probably changes some things. It is. It does change things. It's completely decriminalized here, which means that we're treated like any other business and we have the support of the law to protect us, 
which that's means awesome. that you know that's that changes everything. <laughs> so um, we can set up places that would be uh, you know very safe and very open and welcoming and elegant and gorgeous and invite people in. And people can come for all sorts of different reasons. I'm retired from this, by the way, so don't try and book me now, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm retired in the military, so it works. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, the reasons that people come are, are so varied, uh, yeah. but they're just normal people, absolutely right. normal people who for whatever reason, um, uh, don't have a sexual partner that day and are in the mood and may want to explore themselves and have someone who, who is a playmate with them. So yeah. you get it, you know, that's a healthy, good thing. And if somebody's consensual and wants to do that with you, why not? And my expertise, you know, initially started with um, I, I wasn't really, I didn't know what I was doing when I first got in the industry at all. I just wanted money, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, the, the girls that I encountered, most of them was the same thing. They just wanted mm. money to make an honest living. You know? That's right. Just yep. wanted to make some money. And uh, initially people do, when they first contact you, they are already in an altered state of consciousness. Yeah. Because being aroused is an altered state of consciousness, right? Being that horny is an altered state of consciousness. And yeah. that means that part of uh, the normal everyday thinking mind was offline. And another part was online, yep. which means that you're encountering somebody who's already talking to you from their dirty talk place, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, whoa, whoa. whoa. You, <laughs> and, and you, you get to be somebody that you're not every single day. I mean, that even that, everybody, I don't care who you are, everybody's got that other side that they don't let out, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at that point, you would get that opportunity. Um it's just things have changed so much since since the days that I was uh, around it. You know, I think mm -hmm. even uh, when I was stationed in Korea and Germany, it was legal in those two places as well. And mm -hmm. uh, it's completely changed now from the time when I was in in that industry. The stories that the, the soldiers tell now are, are completely, completely different. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's part of any other industry. It's going to evolve and and. Uh, change to be around the customers that uh it's going to attract um if it doesn't it'll go out of business just like any other industry hmm. yeah it, the, the sex industry is just a concentrated version of how sex is everywhere else it's yeah. a reflection of us it is us it's what it is yep All right <laughs> so yep. it's made up of, of like the people around you your your co-workers your cousins <laughs> it's made up of all of the people you know down at the tuck shop <laughs> it's, yeah. it's how yeah. it is I, yeah, I, um, I completely agree yeah it's just people being people and people can sometimes be annoying and they can sometimes have bad social skills and they can not know what they're doing when they call initially in that altered state of horniness and come across as pretty crass but what can happen is when they um i remember what happened when I first started, I, I didn't have a clue. I just, put, uh, you know, initially I, I um, because I didn't know what I was doing, I went to country towns and mm -hmm. put an ad in the newspaper because I thought I'm not like one of those beautiful models. I'm unconventionally attractive, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe the country folk will be more gentle on me, I thought. And then... <laughs> So I put it out in the newspaper saying busty blonde in town for two days only. And uh, the, you can imagine the kinds of calls you get from that because they've immediately already gone into fantasy. They haven't, yeah. they're not recognizing that they're talking to a real person. They've right. gone into a story into their head. And so they wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, have manners when they call. Right? Right. <laughs> but um, what would happen is when I would, it was way back when, before we had GPSs in the car, I had my own Ford panel van. Can you imagine me driving around the country trying with my paper map trying to find this damn farmer's house? <laughs> 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 trying to walk in heels and in the grass with a... <laughs> the craziest image. <laughs> it's just, 
like the reality of it is just hilarious. Anyway, yeah. um, often somebody would call Crass and I'd get to the door and I'd knock on the door and the very first thing would have, you'd see a little jolt go through them. They're still aroused and they're excited, but they're like, oh, oh, there's a real person there. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> and then something interesting would happen. If I, um, even though I didn't really know what I was doing to start with, I just have this curiosity, this anthropology mind, this I have to work out how everything works. I can't, I can't leave yep. well enough alone. I'm, I'm always poking things and going, what's happening here? What's happening here? So I used to get really curious about each person's erotic wiring because every single person was different mm -hmm. and yet they seem to think that the way sex was is just how sex is because often they were male most of the time and often right. they had been in a position where they had led sex the whole time because that's the social role that they'd been given. So if you lead sex all the time, you're going to follow your own instinct of what's sexy in that moment that and sense. you're going to think that that's what sex is like for everyone because you don't know anything different. Yeah. But when I was encountering each one, every single one of them was different and they were all running this different story in the meaning-making story in the back of their mind of what makes something sexy and what doesn't. And I had to just kind of come in as an improv actor and like, right, I'm working this out on the fly. <laughs> Who are you? What's happening? Yep. <laughs> and what would happen? Because it turns out that I'm really good at that, like really good at that. And um, uh, when I trusted their story, I worked out what their story was and I trusted it and I was able to engage it properly, some mm -hmm. really unexpected and incredible things started happening. Like the last thing that you're thinking about when someone's just called up you know, going, how big are your tits, love? Like, <laughs> <laughs> is that we would end? <laughs> is that we would end up in this, um, it, it like cracked open, in extraordinary state where we're looking at each other with our masks completely gone, and yeah. and often end up in tears because it's so profound and so so touching. When I yeah. uh, and and both of us are just looking at each other, astonished, going, "What just happened? <laughs> what just happened? What, how did that happen? We, we we just went from, you know, like just do you, do you do a threesome or do you take it up the bum or like two? <laughs> <laughs> to, to, oh my god, I can see your soul. Yeah, what happened? And so this is what got me extraordinarily curious about understanding people's sexual fantasies because there was something about following the map that their particular erotic patterning was telling me about mm -hmm. that was actually taking us somewhere important I was like okay. oh there's something in this there's something is and I got really curious and I got more sophisticated with my sex work I ditched the panel van and set up a more swanky place in Sydney with yeah. um multiple different themed rooms and I trained as a dominatrix and I had, um, uh, you know, a sensual room and an erotic massage room and a cross-dressing room and all the different themes that you could have. And uh, it was called The Divinery after my last name. The <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And it, um, I had a red velvet couch and I'd have, have a little tea ceremony when clients came in now. So now I had a different screening process. I'd met other sex workers by then who were very, very switched on and wise and gave me some tips on how to actually do a better job of <laughs> filtering people <laughs> and drawing to me the kinds of clients that I was interested in. Uh, and a, we would sit down on that red velvet couch and I'd ask them all about their sexual fantasies and their past, pre, their past um, peak experiences. And they'd, they'd immediately focus on the physical appearance of whoever they were fantasizing about mm -hmm. and the acts, the sex acts themselves. But I would hear something else. I go, I'm listening to the story. How do stories work? So that's one of the things I'm like, I'm a total story geek. I love to break down how stories work. Yeah. And I just like, okay, what's happening here psychologically that is creating this shifting consciousness from 
Like they'd already one shift of consciousness from every day to horny and then another one again into this beyond, into a, a sort of cracked open heart space of awe and wonder, right? Yes. <laughs> How is this change of consciousness happening through this story? What is this story doing? And I went, oh, well, let's start by paying attention to the the body language and the the attitude of, of, of the person in uh not, rather than just what they look like and what they're doing. Right. Let's take a closer look at um, what kinds of themes are being addressed in here. And after I started poking around in it for a while, what kinds of emotions do they get to feel in here? What, what's, what are the ingredients of the story for that particular person? Mm -hmm. And if I brought those things to life, even though we did totally different sexual activities and I did not look like their ideal fantasy person, Suddenly, they, I started much more consistently finding these these expanded erotic states of consciousness. I'm like, this is a map. This is a map. Oh, my goodness. Sexual fantasies are the exact story that our egos need to hear in order to stand down so we can have an ego dissolution experience and okay. open up to the bigger self behind that. Right. This story is actually a story designed to make our ego safe so we can open to the vulnerability of letting go. <clears throat> that that makes sense. Um, right. You know, just even even the act, you know, you're you're in probably your most vulnerable state anyways. I mean, you're completely naked. You're alone with another person. You know, there's nothing but focus. And I could see how... Um, it kind of does put your ego at a check, you know, when you were first talking though, I was thinking, you know, I, I wonder if there's a relation to just regular dreams, you know, while you're sleeping dreams with this same kind of map. Um, I'm very interested in, in how dreams work and, and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, it, I could see how your fantasies could mm -hmm. also relate to dreams and stuff like that their there's their desires so i was i was just wondering have you noticed if any coalition with that so dreams are uh, yes yes and no they um absolutely fantasies are have the same sort of logic that dreams do i mean like they have you seen some of the the fantasies people have there like a stuck porn stuck porn is is this thing where um it's often a woman who is somehow magically just stuck with her head down in the washing oh. machine and her bottom in the air and she needs help to get out of this stuck position and somehow a penis is involved in getting her free. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yes, it does have the same logic as dreams, right, like where you can yeah. be driving along in a double-decker bus, which also happens to be a 46-storey snail and it makes perfect sense, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, that, that makes sense. Yeah, now that you say that, I just kind of now I, I, my my squirrel attention just went off. And where does that even come from? I mean, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And you know, when you when you see videos like that, you're like, who thinks of this? And why am I watching it? You know? well, what do it's, you get? What do you get to? What would you get to feel or avoid? feeling if a woman is stuck and needs to be rescued and just magically whoops whoopsie I, I, we need a cocked wedge her free <laughs> <laughs> it's like a crescent wedge different sizes <laughs> uh, you know i think i i guess it would kind of be part of your ego men typically like to be the uh the rescuer and and provider and and uh, I think that's also another reason why sex can either boost a man's ego or completely destroy it. Um, but uh, so I, I guess I do see that, you know, um, once you successfully rescued her and um, I guess your your magic tool just did the, the wonder. So I guess it would kind of be an ego boost. Um, I see that. Yes, I think you're onto something. You get yeah. to feel like the hero and you get to yeah. feel wanted. And that means that it's it's way it's way less threatening to be vulnerable when you're the hero, isn't it? Oh, way, yeah. way less. And also, 
um, he didn't have to risk being rejected. This entire yep. scenario came up with something ludicrous, but yeah. it nonetheless <laughs> came up with this. <laughs> You know, it's like, oops, I just turned my head and the cock just fell in my mouth. It wasn't my fault. Like that. <laughs> yeah. I hate when that happens. You know, yeah. you walk, you Next thing you know, there's kids coming. Yeah, yeah. But think about it. So what an ego does, an ego is this part of our brain. I like to call it an organ of the psyche. Because mm -hmm. like it's, it's only one organ, just like we've got hearts that do a heart's job and lungs that do a lung's job. And uh, we don't get mad at the lungs for not doing the heart's job. It only does its job and that's it. So yeah. the ego has a job and it's a good job. It's an important job. The ego gives us a sense of self and it protects yeah. that sense of self. And in fact, we do need that. We can't even operate in the world without uh, a sense of self and an ability to set boundaries around that. Yeah. Uh, that's really really important and it's healthy to have an ego however this ego ego is this castle wall that keeps us protected but it also keeps us separate you can't connect when it's there so temporarily it needs to move out of the way in order for us to be able to move from i to we yeah you know we need to and, and sex is the urge to merge that's what it is yeah so we have to the best sex is always losing yourself Letting go, letting go of that yeah. I, becoming the way, just letting go into the flow. So this story has to somehow convince the guards on the, at, the, at the entrance of that castle to let go. And um, those guards, I, I say there's three guards, one that is there that is there to guard your social status. Oh, no, I can't take that risk in public. I might lose face. Oh, no, <laughs> I'm, you know, if I'm vulnerable, I won't be a manly man. That's the self-identity one. So self, yep. your social status, your self-identity and your um, self-worth. Do they really desire me? Do they really right. want to be here? Do they want me? Like, I really want this. Do they want this? Right. And think about that in terms of um, it become like an, an obvious example is in when you're receiving oral sex, for instance, uh, lots and lots of people will enjoy it to a certain point and then actually stop themselves from continuing after that because they're worried that they're taking up too much time, that they're taking up too much space. Should I finish now and give you a turn? Like, am I being too selfish? Am I taking up too much space? Do you really want to be here doing this for me? Are you turned on by this? Did I remember to shower? Shit. Then... <laughs> <laughs> All of these concerns, right? Do you want to be here doing this with me? Are your needs being fulfilled by that? And we doubt it. And so we don't actually experience the fullness of where we can go because we are, that guard hasn't been appeased, that, that particular yeah. guard. So what happens is this other organ of the psyche that creates our sexual desires and our fantasies comes along and whispers little stories in those guards' ears and says, tells them the exact story that they need to hear that includes the fear of what that guard fears would happen if you were, if you if you were vulnerable enough to go out there beyond the castle walls and be vulnerable <laughs> and it includes the exact antidote to that fear so that's the genius of the sexual fantasy it includes the it, it, so we, we've got an alchemical reaction here we've got this this is what I feared. I feared that you wouldn't want me, but now there's evidence that you do. And now the exact opposite end result happens. Or oh, I fear that if I if I was vulnerable, I would lose control and you'd have power over me and terrible things would happen to me. Uh, but the, the antidote is uh, I did lose control and I did surrender to the moment completely and lose myself. And actually the exact opposite happened. I got all my needs met. Sweet. <laughs> And that can, <laughs> that can come up with this story, like a, a fantasy example of how that works yeah. is there's a really common fantasy of um, being forced to have sex. Right? And, and nobody, nobody wants forced sex in real life. That's right. not, this is not what we're talking about here. Right. We're talking right. about a story that can just tell those guards the right thing so it gives you permission to focus on yourself and let go and surrender. And so an example of that is, um, oh, 
if I just lie here and receive oral sex and you're doing it really sweetly, uh, I'm going to doubt myself. I'm not going to be 100% sure that you 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 want to be here. But if you break into the house and tie me up and say, I am going to give you oral sex until I'm done with you, <laughs> then I'm like, oh, you're a selfish person doing it for yourself. Oh, your needs are met. Oh, you want to be here? Sweet. I can relax now. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not my fault because I'm still a good girl. So my identity as a good girl is protected. Yep. And uh, and and then I can now let go of my ego and I can I can go into bliss. I can go into ecstasy and beyond. I, I that does make sense. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of the stuff that you're saying, um, it seems kind of like, in order to know what you like to build these fantasies, um, experience is kind of required. So, you know, I'm picturing the 18, 19, 20 year old um, teenage person, not not fully unknowing what it is that they like. They know what they want to do and, and they know what they want to achieve. But they don't necessarily know what you're talking about. They're not going to feel that it's all going to be physical. Um, you're tying in more emotional um, releases. And so. My, my question is in your thoughts, um, cause I've heard, I've heard both arguments. I've heard people say that porn does provide that. And then I've also heard people say that it's not healthy for kids, you know, of the 2021 20, that's still not fully matured to use porn as a measuring device. Um, what is your thoughts? Wh where, where do you think these fantasies develop? Is it just from over, time of learning and and saying oh i did this and i actually enjoyed that you know and so you have to kind of figure it out as well or or do you think that it is okay to have some sort of you know things to watch to spike that imagination and say oh i'd like to try that i think that um i think that porn is just stories it's just right. our own internal mind turned right. into theater Yep. But, but, you know, but it looks weird and it's hard to accept that when you don't understand what sexual fantasies are because you're saying, right. what do you mean? That's not realistic. You can't have a, a two-story bus that's also a 46-story snail. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. It, like, <laughs> that's not. If you think that that's how sex is, then you're going to have a problem. But if you're looking at it and going, oh, this is actually just a representation, this is theatre. Yeah. This is theater of our psyche. This is telling a story. What can we learn from the story? Yeah. Then you're absolutely right. There is an art form to bringing it to life. If I just tried to live out my client's fantasies as it was in their mind's eye, it would be very hit and miss and they often yeah. wouldn't get anywhere near where they were trying to go. Yeah. But when I suddenly understood what the underlying narrative was underneath, I'd sometimes do things that were completely different to what they told me their fantasy was, but I was... I was activating that same psychological safety mechanism inside them, which gave them the perfect level of risk and safety. Yeah. And and then, then they were able to let go of their egos and, and they'd end up in a, a totally different place. Even yeah. people who were really experienced in sex or BDSM um, and came and they said, I've been doing this for 30 years. I know all of the consent things. I want this, 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 blah, blah, blah. I've been doing it. I, you know, I teach this stuff. I'm the expert. And then if I approached it with this, new lens that I had that I developed and put it suddenly they were opening up to places that we that they that they were like what even is this I, I had no idea I could feel this way yeah I had no idea and I'll tell you what it felt like like you'd start off with some I don't know some scenario where it's you know forced by and there's cross-dressing and there's a glory hole and you know none of it seems in the slightest bit spiritual whatsoever and yet yet in the end, we'd end up, if I followed the poison and the antidote and, and included that thing, we'd end up in this place where, honestly, it really and honestly feels like you're looking at their soul through the eyes and they could see mine too. And it's, and it's a feeling of awe and wonder. And it feels like, well, sometimes they would say, it feels like psychedelics or drugs, like when your ego's out of the way. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and yet it's the exact opposite because it's really instead of escapism, it's really coming home to this, who I always was and and was trying to get to and, and didn't know how to. This yeah. feels like the real me. And 
I, I sometimes try and describe it by saying it feels like my higher self and my most primal self have merged together in perfect unity and they're here now without my ego in the way. Yeah, that mm. makes perfect sense. And and one thing I do want to add for, for the listeners out there, because mm. I know I'll probably get these comments. We are not talking about what you see on the dirty side of, of sex, you know, the human trafficking, the, the child pornography. We are talking about two consenting adults in legal terms, you know, uh, of doing these acts. We're not talking about people being forced, as you said earlier. No one wants to be trade. forced. Right. Not. So you have to you have to get past that first to even begin to understand what it is that you're saying. If you if you constantly have that everything is bad, there's nothing good of this, then you'll never see the good. And and I completely understand what it is that you're saying. Yeah, you're right. But it's funny that people can tell the difference between, you know, there is forced child marriages in the world. Yet yeah, they don't try they do not try and ban marriage because they can right. tell the difference between the two. Like yeah. there is a difference. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so. Yep. You are you are absolutely right. Um and and it and humans are just very odd people. I mean, we really are. Um, you know, we we're tribal people but we're not designed to be the same around millions of us. You know, we're a small tribal people and that's why you see things that happen in the bigger cities that you don't necessarily see as much in the, in the littler cities. So, you know, it's like, there's, there's has to be a balance in everything in life. And I think some of the, the fantasies and stuff that you're talking about is people need to have that balance. They have to have that time to go out there and, and, be somebody else, have their ego checked and, and be vulnerable. Um, if not, you will self implode. Um, I think we kind of see that with, with veterans and, and not talking and everything else. They hold everything in. They don't never get to be who they really want to be because they, they have this image now that they have to portray. I can't cry. I can't, I can't say that I'm broke. And at some point you finally self implode. So um, I do see what, what it is that you're saying. And, and it does make perfect sense to me. I'd love to tell this story then. That's a beautiful segue. Um, when I was still a sex worker, I initially, early on, I had um, ridiculous, now I look back on it, ridiculous idealistic um, ideas that war should not exist at all. So everything was all, just all oh, war is bad. <laughs> everything yeah. to do with what I just put it all in one big hippie bag of idealism and went, you know, <laughs> who'd be yeah. a soldier? Like I, I didn't get it at all, to be honest. Right. And one day I went to work in Canberra, which is a capital city here in Australia. And a friend of mine um, is a, a vet and he uh, took me to see the war memorial, the Anzac Memorial, which is the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps um, mm -hmm. group from, from Gallipoli in 1915. And he took me through this place, this, this incredible place, and the rows upon rows of names. He knew the stories. He was a historian. He, he pointed that name and he'd tell me, the story of this person and what they ended up doing in the field. And, and they were all these young, young men with their whole lives ahead of them. Yeah. They're, they're, and, and he knew, and he, and he does this, he just continuously does this. He, he didn't, tar doesn't charge anyone. He just takes people in and, and tells the stories of these people, which is like such a profound way of honoring these people. Yeah. And it was for the first, I'm getting teary now. <laughs> 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 like I got a wake up call today. <laughs> it was it was like um the most astonishing thing to realize the sacrifice that had been made so that I could have my idealistic ideas. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, you are you are absolutely right. And and you know, something that a lot of people don't think about is is those veterans that are in that uh situation. They have ideas too. Yeah. They're not, you know, they may have went over there with one thought, mm -hmm. but when they come back, they have another. Um, and, and for us, you know, all the vets 
have their opinions on whether we should have been, whether we shouldn't have been, you know, um, why we did what we did. All those things still go through everybody's mind. So we're no yeah. different than than the other people. The only difference was we signed a contract and put ourselves in a situation that you just can't run away and, and quit that job. And I think that's where a lot of people are like, well, if you didn't want to do it, why don't you just quit? Well, that's because there's this thing called jail that I don't really care to go to, mm. you know? And so, so they forget that, that we're humans too. And yeah. what your, your friend is doing is, is amazing because mm. nobody knows. And, and that's one of the reasons for my show. Nobody knows in 30 years mm. what history is going to be taught and what story is going to be told. Mm. And it's important that we all document our stuff. No different than what you are doing today. You know, mm. um, if you look back uh, and you, t you hear the stories of, sex workers back in the, the, the late 1800s, you know, in the wild west, you have a different, you know, the people of that time had a whole different thought process of, of those people, you mm -hmm. know, it was more accepted than it is in today's world, at least in America. Mm -hmm. And imagine if those stories of the old west wasn't taught that way, you know, if they mm -hmm. were taught that the people back then were being forced and it was not good and, and everything else. Um, and, and I don't believe that, you know, I, I do believe more of the story that's told today. And yeah. so you can't rely on, on other people to tell your story. You have that's to right. tell your story. Well, let's, let's add, let's weave those two stories together. Yeah. So, um, fresh from coming back from Canberra to Sydney after that, after that tour, and it was still fresh an experience of me. Like I don't necessarily approve with, of you know the governments who can sometimes be corrupt and create wars that don't necessarily have to be there but i was now 100 percent behind the actual so soldiers <laughs> the actual people fighting them and uh one of the first clients who turned up to my door when i got back was a young army guy i was in my, i was about 35 he's about 22 he turned up to my door for a bdsm session he turned up dressed neat as a pin with a bunch of flowers and said yes ma'am a lot and he was yep. <laughs> he was absolutely adorable and then my little my heart just cracked open I was like oh my god <laughs> come in <laughs> come in and, <laughs> and um uh, and he was he just won the lottery because I happened to just project all of those new feelings that I <laughs> had <laughs> <a lot to hear. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he became a client for well over a decade he became wow. a, a, and he, we even dated briefly but that didn't work so we I made him become my client to get a make <laughs> <laughs> don't don't think your fantasies are real life because that, that doesn't work anyway yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um uh but he would come and see me after his uh overseas duties and he um uh he he would come and see me and ask for specific kinky things, which on the surface you'd go, why? Why does he want that? But actually when I look at how his psyche was working, it was actually a genius thing that his, his, his fantasies were doing for him. It was absolutely incredible. It was taking the, the war out of him and allowing him to be violent, uh, not violent, vulnerable, <laughs> opposite of that. <laughs> yep. No, I, it's, it is important. You have to have that release. You, know, right. you really do. And, and his fantasies were creating the exact psychological conditions that he needed to make that possible for him. Otherwise, he just wouldn't have known how to do it. Yeah. And, and, and if I didn't, if I had judged his fantasies and not trusted them, mm -hmm. I would have rejected his way of processing and releasing this stuff. So it, it was so important that I create this safe place where I just trust their turn-ons, then right. create a really safe container around it and um, and act it out in very consensual ways that keeps everyone physically, emotionally and psychologically safe. But, uh, you know, this is an art form. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> that's why I teach it. That's what I do for a living. I teach people how to do this, how to get to the deeper levels of their own sexuality mm -hmm. Um uh, safely because you're right those you know horny 18 year olds th think that they just literally have to live out the fantasy to try and get those feelings and that's not how it works at all yeah 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 so. absolutely and and that is something i wanted to kind of dig into a little bit 
is the the teaching side of this hmm. how does that work are we talking about um you know are you just teaching other workers or are you teaching more on the psychology side of of what what is happening are, are we talking like psychologists and doing studies or both so um i'm not officially a, a trained in psychology Mm -hmm. um, and yet somehow I've become the person that psychologists seek out to learn how to do this stuff. Yeah. So uh, because they don't have this, under this is a new understanding of how, you know, they, they just think it's some unfinished childhood business processing its way out. I'm saying it's something quite radically different, saying actually sexual fantasies, all even all the taboo ones and, and the seemingly twisted ones are actually just stories that represent the natural, normal healthy psychological mechanisms that have to take place to move from one state of consciousness to another they have to un, uh, they have to somehow appease our ego defenses and let them down so even if you had the perfect childhood and you didn't have to go to war and you didn't have anything to process at all mm -hmm. you would still have people with lots of domination and submission and taboo fantasies and all of the things because that's uh, when you understand the the, the how to break that story down it's going to be there it's just inherently there yeah but also on top of that if you've got something to process because of your childhood trauma and your your experiences in life then that can also get processed through this as well uh, but anyway they they start um because it's not just a theory I, i've got a whole system i teach people how to create the kinds of experiences that i was uh, creating in the divinery so I just called it the divinery method so <laughs> um, but I'm teaching the experts who can then teach other people yeah. um, so I'm the one who ends up teaching the other sex workers the other dominatrixes the, the sexologists the sex educators and the therapists and also anyone who is just um, they're more advanced and self-aware and they're ready for they just they, they've, they've decided they want to make the erotic a priority in their life and they want to be able to create ongoing um, in-depth experiences for themselves and their lover um uh you want to use the erotic as a, as a, a way of exploring yourself yeah and and it's a, and there's a spiritual path actually it's actually a spiritual path because when you, we were talking about how you lose yourself by following this map internal map that your genius mind came up with um you lose your sense of self and you can merge with another person. You can move from I to we, but actually quite often we'd move into these even deeper profound oneness states, which is the goal of so many different spiritual paths, meditation and all of these yeah. other places. But we were getting there through smart, like this experience where you just lose yourself and you're, you know, you get a tiny taste of it when you're standing on the beach at night and you're feeling so small and you're looking at the vastness of the ocean and the phosphorescence in the waves and you're looking at the stars and you're, you're contemplating how enormous eternity is and your mind can't handle it and you sort of just crack open into this whoa all moment it's that kind of feeling and, yep. and this you feel so small that you're nothing at all and yet so connected with everything this kind of oneness feeling this yeah. this is what we were getting from sex from smutty sex yeah <laughs> this is where it was going so it's becoming a spirit so people who want to um recognize and explore that part of ourselves and when you have direct really lived emotionally felt psychologically experienced oneness experiences life you can't deny life you can't it changes you yeah changes so you. i i don't know much about um dominatrix and and that type of stuff um how does that come how do, how does that work as far as pulling these feelings out of people i mean i, I know what it is but i don't know a lot about it yeah okay great question um Okay, so what does an ego fear? It fears that somebody's it fears being vulnerable, mm -hmm. and that somebody else is going to take uh, uh, control over you and hurt you if you're vulnerable. Yep. And um, uh, that, and you might lose your dignity. You might, you, you know, you might lose your your social status. You have to be on your knees. Uh, uh, so this is a story that is enacting all of those fears. Okay. 
it's enacting it as, as theatre. It's just living out the, but it's including the poison, what you fear, and the antidote because the exact opposite happens. You do have someone take control over you. You do become deeply vulnerable. You have lost your dignity. You're now on, the, on your knees ready to beg, right? Yep. <laughs> you, you might be tied up. You have no power. You're very vulnerable. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. uh, but what happens is even though she's saying all of the scary, she may say all of the scary words that you feared she said, she also includes the antidote which is actually taking care of them while they're vulnerable, actually giving them the exact pleasure that they needed while they were vulnerable. Like it's actually, it's not just, the media just shows the poison. It doesn't, doesn't show the antidote. Right. When you live it, it's, it's, it's the poison and the antidote. It's the alchemical, the exact opposite end result than you thought it would be. So I would actually often recognise that if you were to turn your own psychological processes into theatre, that you were to turn your own ego into a character so that you could interact with it, wouldn't it look a little bit like a dominatrix? Yeah. Kind, kind yeah. of rocking her power, thinking she's hot shit. Of course you should kiss the ground that I just walked on. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> I mean, I... Yeah, I do. I can kind of relate to that because I think back to, you know, as I was growing up, um, seeing girls that were into cars and things that I was in, I found that sexy. You know, mm -hmm. I I liked that. And uh, I never have been really attracted to the the girly girls. I'm more of a like in tomboys and girls that aren't afraid to get dirty and, and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. so I can kind of relate um, because I had a little bit of a different outlook on what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess taking that to the other extreme, if I was with somebody that didn't fit that, and mm -hmm. then they completely surprised me and I be had to become submissive to a person that I didn't seek out. Yeah, mm -hmm. I could I could see how now fear and and all that stuff is going to come out and and uh with anything you're going to have emotions that are going to come with them mm. so that does make sense <clears throat> well think about it like you, you mentioned the um you know lots of guys like to be the hero but that's the public face of what yeah. when you see them behind like i get to see them when they they don't have to perform their masculinity for other right. people. And, and it, even as a sex worker who's not, like in my role that was not as a dominatrix, it was just as a regular sex worker, um, I would see the utter relief in men when they got to not be the one that had to lead. They did not have to be the one that was in control. And so many of their, so much of their fantasies was actually uh, in some way or another um, uh, the woman was actually uh, asserting her desire for them and initiating on them and taking them and somehow that and they didn't have to take the risk to, to, to ask her out or or be the one that was fun, like the fantasy resolved that for them uh, but that me also meant that they knew that they were wanted like if she was the one that was going to demand that they do this thing yeah. then that's going to also make them safe to do it isn't it they're doing yeah. it for her her yeah. needs are getting met Oh, you really do want to be here doing this with me. Oh, okay. I, I can let myself go and enjoy this moment. Yeah. So having her be in, in uh, take the lead and, and be primal and dirty uh, is very common. Very, very common. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that makes sense because, again, everything else is image, just like, just like you said, mm -hmm. you know, that the, I have to be strong. I can't cry. I can't show emotions. I have to be the provider. Or I, you know, I have to make the most money. I have to run the household. You know, these are all social demands that are put on, on men, not necessarily what that man wants. Um, and so that does make sense. Um, mm. I, I do. I see more. I never really understood it. You know, you see it in the movies and I'm just like watching these guys and I'm like, what are you getting out of this? But I, it does make sense because you get tired. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I can tell you, I got tired of deploying and mm -hmm. then coming home and feeling like, okay, now I'm back home after being gone a year. 
I have to be back in charge of this house. Now mm-hmm. that I'm back, you did a good job while I was gone, but now it's my turn because if I don't, everybody around me is going to think that I'm weak because I'm not running my house. And mm-hmm. I finally just got tired of that. And I said, this ain't working. Mm-hmm. You know? When I came home, I quit trying to be the boss mm-hmm. and uh, I quit caring what other people said. And I instantly did feel better about it because That's it great. put a lot of anxiety and stress on you for trying to portray something that is not the case. Right. You know, no human, no human is, can be invincible and invulnerable all the time. It's just not, it's just not how it can be healthy for anybody. It's, and you're right though we have so much pressure on men to never show their vulnerability and another way a sexual fantasy can resolve that for them and again i'm using the kinkier ones because that make they they create clearer examples but it'll be in the in the so-called vanilla the more classical forms of sex as well uh it's absolutely there once you once you see it you can't unsee it but but you just described that fear everybody is going to think that i am um, less of a man if I don't take charge again. Uh, oh. I'm going to lose my social status. There's that yep. social, that's that guard on the on the bridge on the way out, right? Yep. How uh, uh, they're going to think that I'm like a girl. I'm not a manly man, right? Yep. This is not a logical part of us that's thinking this. Even if you're like a really forward thinking person, this pressure is still on you, and you have to process it somehow. Right? Yep. <laughs> it's, it's there. It's there. And so maybe that fantasy comes out with, oh, you know, so if I'm the one that that lets go and receives pleasure, just lets go and surrenders and receives lots of pleasure, that makes me uh, lose my status. I'm just going to become a girl. I'm going to be a sissy. So this clever part of your brain goes, oh, you're afraid you're going to be a sissy, are you? Let's... Mm -hmm. Let's turn that into a turn on then so that we can, we're not going to let that block you. I refuse to let you miss out on this beautiful part of yourself. So let me tell you a story that makes your fear hot, right? It's going to be super sexy for you now to have a a really sexy woman force you to wear pink frilly knickers (laughs) (laughs) and call you a sissy as she forces you to receive the very pleasure that you really wanted to receive and forces you to let go and just surrender into the pleasure and finally allows and you can see her excitement even as she's teasing you and that gives valid the opposite of rejection for being vulnerable is her excitement for you in that moment there's the antidote again yep that makes that makes perfect sense i i completely get it now yeah Yeah. that makes makes perfect sense um (laughs) So I, I know we're getting to the top of the hour. Something else I wanted to dig into, because like I said earlier, I, I had released my first book and I know what the challenges are. It's not easy to write a book. I don't mm-hmm. care what anybody says. It's not. What what brought you to uh, write this book? Was it just because you are you were moving into a new chapter? You were retiring from the actual work and you wanted to continue the teaching portion of it? or Or was it that there was still unfinished business that you wanted to clear up some of the the misnomers of of how this works i feel as though i well i actually have that's not i feel i have stumbled on something that could change change the world yeah and if people i really understood how the erotic works and could form healthy relationships with it this could be profound this could bring us all home to ourselves And I want to be able to provide a way for people to be able to do that. I want them to be able to understand. I want them to have the stories. I want them to be, at the moment, so many people are stuck in fear. They're in such fear of their own minds. Yeah. They can't trust themselves because they don't know how how this works. It doesn't make sense to them. But once you have some tools and some understanding of how this works, not only can you have a better sex life and great orgasms, but the way that we treat each other and interact with each other can change. Yep. This is, it's like this, this could solve so many problems. So I wrote, um, uh, it's not out yet, but if, if you want to, to get on my mailing list to, to not miss out, it's going to be called The Spirituality of Smut. Um, and you can get on my mailing list actually by doing a, a little, I've got a little gift for you if you want it, which is 
a little exercise for free that you can do to um, start understanding your own erotic story. So breaking it down a little bit, I'll just walk you through step by step. And it's an exercise. You don't have to confess your fantasies to anyone. It's not, it's not explicit even. You can even do it on your commute, but probably not in front of the kids. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> wear earphones. <laughs> Yeah. is uh, um, uh, basically the exercise is bringing up uh, a Google search image of, ce of a celebrity that you find attractive. You don't have to have actually actively had a fantasy about them, but you've, that it helps if you have, but it doesn't matter if you haven't. You just find them attractive. And normally when you think, why am I excited by this? You think, oh, because they're beautiful. Obviously, duh, why did you even ask me? But look at when you get four or five images of exactly the same person with exactly the same face, exactly the same body, and they're in, they're different images, you're going to find yourself more drawn to some pictures than others. Yeah. Why? I'm going to walk you through how to look closer at that, and uh, that will reveal stories you weren't conscious of, that ways in which your mind was creating your own poison and antidote and things that you can start to bring in deliberately into your own sex life. Yeah, you know, in baby steps, <laughs> and you can I get that. At, that you yeah, are right. you are yeah. right. So you can yeah. get that at myfantasyis.com. That one there. Okay, <laughs> and I will make sure that that all these links are are in the the bios and and everything that I do, so people don't have to worry about remembering the the links. And uh, if there's, I tell everybody, if there's ever anybody that that wants to get in con contact and they can't figure out how to do it, they can always reach out to me and, and I will connect uh, everybody as well. So um, don't hesitate. Click on the link. I'm definitely curious about the book. I, I've got to read more. So I can't wait till, when does it come out? Well, I would love to have an answer for that, but it depends <laughs> on how many more times I have to do the re-edit, the, the, the editing process. <laughs> It is, it is torture without the pleasure. Yes. <laughs> I That's agree. right. <laughs> you know, that, that book I wrote was about me and I'm so sick of me now because I've had to reread it so many times. <laughs> yes. So I can relate. The editing process is the worst part. And, uh, mm. you know, if you've never wrote a book before, I can tell you the first time that you do it will be the worst time because uh, you're going to edit yourself even more than you would. Um, I learned the best way to do it is to not give a shit when you first start. Just get the words on the paper. Mm. And when the book is wrote, then go back and start the editing process. And what I did was I wrote a chapter, I edited a chapter. And then I wrote mm. a chapter, and then I edited a chapter. And then I found out that by the time I got to the end, chapter one had to change, and I had to re-edit it again. And so... <laughs> It just became an endless cycle of, of, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I understand wise words there, Donald. <laughs> it, it is not easy to write a book. So my hat's off to you. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I had a great time. Um, and I, like I said, I'll make sure all the, the stuff is out there. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll put you in the green room. We'll throw the exit video out and uh, I'll be with you in just a few minutes. Okay. All right. Thanks for coming on. All right, everybody. So it is awesome to be able to have these kind of uh, adult conversations and, and not have a bias and just be open minded and listen to the information that's be provided. Don't try to put context to it in your own method. Take the words and the information that was given, put some thought into it open mindedly. And you may find out that there is another whole world out there that may interest you. And it starts by listening, being open-minded, and understanding that we're all different. And we all have the, the good and the bad in us. It's part of balance. And without it, you're never going to get anywhere. So I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all take the time to, to get the book when it comes out or, or even go to her, her website and reach out to her and, and ask any open-minded questions um, that you have. And I'm sure she'd be glad to answer them. So hey, I appreciate all of you guys coming out. It means a lot. I enjoy everybody that listens to the show. 
without you guys, this show wouldn't happen. So thank you. Make sure that you subscribe and do all that good stuff that us uh, guys like to keep reminding people to do. Y'all take care and remember, don't let the day kick your ass. Kick its ass.